had for ourselves, for our families pre-pandemic, what that looks like now, how, how are we managing and uh, how this is impacting our overall mental health with, within ourselves, our family and the community at large. We're then going to move into grief and loss during the pandemic. So that's not, it's not, we're not going to focus specifically just on death, but around the overall loss of our typical routines. And again, the plans that we had for, for the future, um, things that we've had to alter or, or place on hold for right now. And then we're going to move into just steps moving forward. So how do we support ourselves and others? Um, and, and as we're managing all these different trends that are coming up. Um, and then as well, there's a little component around some research that was done um, that I'll, I'll provide. That's gonna help normalize um, some of the things that we're all experiencing. So I'm gonna just share my screen here. And Chris, is, are you able to see that? I just want to double check. Hello. Yeah, looks okay. great. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, so with, with regards to disruption, uh, the transitional rites of passage, during COVID, um, we as a community, we've been providing with ongoing information around COVID. Most recently too, now is the new variances that are um, in, our, in our areas, as well looking at um, getting all that information around safety precautions, measures that have been outlined by the government. Um, We've also now really started receiving more information around um, the overall impact that this is having on individuals and their mental health. Um, individuals that may have already had pre-existing mental health conditions or uh, others who um, are experiencing uh, concerns related to mental health, they're having you know, the, the symptoms um, showing up now. Um, and, um, you know, the other, the, the, another thing that I kind of want to highlight is um, with regards to the disruptions, um, what's driving this is that, um, you know, we're having so many different changes come up, um, safety guidelines and legislation, um, that ongoing media coverage where we're hearing the reported cases, death toll numbers, the economic strain, um, and then as well now, uh, that back and forth um, that individuals have to do and those adjustments that have to be made and completed to go from in-person work or school to online and that back and forth right now. Um, with this information um, and the shifts in the public health status, um, we're, we're noticing that um, it's impacting community stress levels. Um, and this, the stress is being caused by that loss of control and um, trying to navigate through the unknown. Um, what we also uh, have here um, is just some of the symptoms, some of the things that um, we can, we're, we all may be experiencing or maybe seeing in, in the individuals that we provide support to. Um, so what we may see, see uh, right now, we, we have the coin term of COVID burnout, uh, COVID fatigue, um, and we're hearing that more and more, um, you know, through conversations with uh, close family members, uh, co-workers, as well as uh, through the media. Um, and so what this is, is it's when uh, people are experiencing uh, mental exhaustion as a result of the natural hypervigilance um, that occurs during in increased stress and specifically surrounding safety. We, we all experience this historically throughout the course of our lifetime, but with the pandemic, because of the length we're going on to a year, um, you know, it, it's heightened and, you know, we're at a point where our bodies are trying to trying to regulate it. Um, so what we could be seeing from people that are experiencing the COVID burnout, COVID fatigue, is um, you know complacency uh, regarding safety protocols, increased frustration, um, experiencing racing thoughts. Um, so as well, uh, this can be driven uh, not only um, 
sorry, this can be driven by not only not being able to access or participate in our normal coping strategies. So things like going for visits, going out for dinner, going to the gym. Um, you know, what's happening is, is with this loss, um, we're also, or with the loss or the pause of activities, we're also losing that sense of connectedness, um, enjoyment and hope. Um, so what so some of the things especially um, when we're providing support and then as well for ourselves we want to be in tune to um, you know what we're experiencing so if we're noticing like a loss of routine or motivation and you know maybe not just one day but uh, for a few days if, the, if this is starting to become more consistent um, if we're starting to feel overwhelmed or that increase in distress um, reduce self-care is a good warning sign as well and then again, and we're going to go into it is just viewing the world through uh, through negative self talk through that through the negative lens. And then we also want to be aware of isolating and withdrawing. And um, for individuals, um, especially with uh, online learning, it may be more difficult to have that connection. Um, so we we want to you know if we're the person that's providing support maybe sending out that additional email um, just so we can we can keep uh, keep uh, keep on track and, and and be aware of what's happening. So I, I was as I went through we were I was bringing up thinking patterns so you know a lot of the times we're more focused on what our behavioral reactions to stress are um, because those are present people are able to really see them but what we want to really be looking at as well is um, the types of thoughts that we're experiencing and that comes from that the cognitive behavior therapy perspective and it's because the thoughts impact our emotional state which impacts our, our reactions um, so throughout the course of my work um, with providing uh, therapy during COVID, the ones that are really um, standing out in, in sessions would be the fortune telling. So predicting the, uh, the future negatively. Um, I will never get back on campus. If there, was a, if there was a death, I'm never going to be able to live without this person. Um, catastrophizing as well. So that's that all or nothing thinking. Um, I'll catch COVID and die. Um, you know, if I if I decide to get the vaccination, I'm going to have a negative reaction. Um, another big one that's really coming out, especially during this um, the the second lockdown that we're experiencing in, in our area, is the negative filtering. So focusing in, in on all the negatives um, as opposed to letting those positive inputs come in, um, and so. You know, an, an example of that is looking at all the things that you've had to change or things that have had change versus what you've been able to do, the adjustments you've made or the accomplishments. Um, and then unfair comparison is another one that uh, that we're noticing. Um, and that's really interpret interpreting events in terms that are unrealistic. So one of the one of the examples for that um, during pre-COVID times would be um, we would see individuals comparing self to others, comparing, you know, um, how one student um, is able to uh, push out an assignment, but it takes me longer. Um, but now what we're noticing as we're as uh, COVID is going on longer is we're seeing people um, starting to do that unfair comparison uh, comparisons to what they what they were or what they were doing pre-COVID. So we want to be aware of that. Um, how we would uh, support other people and as well as um, identify that for our, ourselves is the first thing is we want to identify um, the thought that the thought the specific thought that's causing distress. Um, we then want to kind of move through of asking ourselves in the moment, how much do I believe what I'm thinking right now? Um, when we have that heightened distress, you know, it may on a scale of zero to 100, we may be feeling at it at a 99 or a 100. And, and that's okay. But once we can start doing that rating of the thought, then what happens is we're starting to uh, gain control over, over what we're thinking. We're slowing it down. So we're better able um, to challenge it. And we do that. Um, through fact checking, um, taking in all the information, um, and in working through this, it's it's 
it's uh, broadening and, uh, and allowing ourselves to shift to more of, a, of an acceptance um, of, what, of what we're doing, what the community is doing for safety as well, it's gonna help reduce kind of rumination. And, and that's, we look at that specifically around uh, grief as well, um, but it, it slows down that rumination and it helps just the overall uh, increase in mood. So Chris, I don't know if you if you had any questions. Um, actually, as you were talking, one thing came up, and I remember we initially touched on it. We were sort of doing a bit of planning for the session, and when I think about this grief and loss specifically in relation to our campus community, I've always fixated on our students' experience. You know, naturally, going through post secondary is such a huge rite of passage in our lives, and it's built up for so many years leading up to it, and it's a time of sort of discovery and transition and education and sort of carving out a path for the future. And, and you brought up to me a really important point was how invested the whole family unit is also, like parents are so invested in that process. Um, even the people working in the campus environment who have dedicated their lives to supporting students and watching them go through that process of growth. Um, when it comes to disruptions in those more extended areas, so like the entire family, have you noticed anything in particular with the people you're working with, or is that relational part a big part of the narrative or dialogue that's happening? Um, yeah, there, and especially now too, adding in um, all those high school students that have been going through university applications, right? Um, so we are noticing that uh, an increase, uh, an increase in stress, an increase in worry um, is a big one um, because you know it's how am I planning for what my next steps are. Um, you know, if, you know, looking into um, moving into the September, September months, am I, am I going to go move on to residence? Um, are we still planning on doing that trip to, to the other city or, you know, even, um, you know, so it's causing stress um, within the family system because we have um, young adults, uh, some adolescents that, you know, we've, you know, while they were growing up, if post-secondary was something that was always talked about, um, you know, now now they're now it's being met with with that unknown. So that that's at times can cause uh, tension, especially um, when um, students, uh, younger students, you know, a lot of the times first year students are looking for their to their families for guidance, right? And and that that help with the decision making. And what's happening is is parents. Um, are giving the information, but they, they can't say for certain, right? And, and as a parent, and we're very excited for our kids to be um, moving into post-secondary or attending post-secondary, um, it's, it's causing a lot of worry and concern for them. The other piece uh, too is that transition from in-person to online, right? That grieving of the loss of like, I'm not getting that experience. I'm missing out on, you know, um, that the university or college life that, that I had planned for. Um, so what's happening is so what we're doing within in the work is really just normalizing the you know, normalizing the experience for um, for students uh, for for parents and and uh, and you know having them work towards that acceptance piece um, as we go through. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for that. Um, there's a second one if if you have time. If you don't sure. Mind. Um, and this has to do with when when disruption maybe starts to shift to potentially more enduring changes. Um, and this is what I've noticed in sort of now that this second prolonged wave is happening, we're actually starting to see some shifts in society that might be indicative of like more permanent changes and, and transformations to the world. Um, and when this starts to happen, um, do you have any advice for people on how to like position those conversations with with students or with people on campuses to like to work through that acceptance that you know what this might not just be a little blip it might actually be a bigger a bigger change and a more prolonged one. 
um, yeah, so so the, the first one is, is be, being as clear and concise as we can. The okay. other piece is, and especially when we're providing for a support for people, we want we want to, you know, and, and when, when people are feeling distressed, sometimes we just want to make them feel better. Um, it's okay to say that, you know, I don't, I don't know how exactly how this is going to uh, roll out, but, but you know, acknowledging and especially with virtual and uh, with academics, right, and learning, um, we kind of saw this shift starting a little bit anyways, even before COVID hit, right? So right. what it is, is just uh, helping students realize or recognize that, you know, there's still going to be those supports, even though you're not necessarily sitting in a lecture hall or sitting in an office, um, you're still going to have th that uh, um, availability, people are, you're still going to be able to access if if people are very stressed about that it's even walking them through okay this is how you would access um, this counselor or this is how you would access um, this professor it's giving it's helping doing that problem solving and giving as much factual information as we can um, you know I know we don't have all the answers to things um, so if so if a question is asked that we don't have the answer to it's okay to say that i don't have that answer because at least what that means what what that's doing is it's recognizing um for the individuals that that we're supporting um that i'm hearing your question it's a valid question it's just i don't have the answer for you because sometimes when we leave things vague it can actually increase anxiety because the person leaves the conversation and then we have these racing thoughts that are that are happening that fortune telling or mind reading, right? Oh, well, this is what's going to happen with the university or the college. And although it's the information's not there. So um, really, it's just acknowledging where the person where the person is at, giving the facts that we have, knowing that that it's okay to say, you know, I don't have that information, but then also giving, um, providing that support of, okay, this is how you would access different things. Um, so it may, you know, more time may be spent and I can speak to the University of Windsor they had used the blackboard system um, and more time may have to be spent on how to navigate through that right just to help reduce the anxiety to help uh, students be able to shift their focus well thank you those are some really practical considerations to be made appreciate it and as we go through this section, I think um, I think some of the info, so some of the information through the grief and loss. Again, um, it can all be adapted to loss of an activity, loss of of a plan. So it doesn't necessarily um, um, have to deal with specific death. Um, so I, I've tried to integrate that that as well. So that so as I go through this piece, we may have some more clarification. Okay. Great. Um, so the first thing with grief and loss is we always want to we always um, want to support and normalize an individual's own grief. So everybody is going to grieve uh, differently. Um, we want to we want to support that grief and just al allow the person to share their narrative, allow that to flow, um, because the biggest thing around grief and loss is um, that it's not effective um, for us to keep grief in. Um, our bodies naturally want to move toward healing. So if we're feeling that we have to keep it in, um, that that can that can um, hinder uh, the grief the grieving process. Um, there, there's realistic expectations for grief. So we would expect, you know, when especially too during this pandemic, we're going to expect that we're going to see a variety of shifting thoughts and feelings. Um, there's no quick fix for grief. Um, a lot of the times, um, you know, people will experience the emotion and they, you know, because grief is so strong, they, they, they want to release it. Um, but there's not a quick fix. We want to be we want to take the time to process through it um, and because with the time that that we're allowing ourselves to do that we're giving ourselves that time to heal and it's going to reduce those strong pangs of grief naturally um, David Kessler um, you noted you can't heal hear, heal what you don't feel and I think that is a big uh, statement to kind of keep in the back of our mind especially when we're supporting students um, we don't we don't want people to just be 
blocking or bearing their emotions. We want to allow them to, to feel it. Um, we need to feel the pain of grief and loss to heal from it. So that's that recognition of grief and loss um, and building our confidence in our ability to manage it. Um, always remembering that loss or grief, it, it hurts more before it hurts less. Um, we tend to feel shock and numbness um, at the beginning, and these are natural defense mechanisms. Uh, all, we all experience this at the onset of grief and loss. Um, this helps for those early days of plannings and social gatherings. So if, we looking, if we're looking at that from a COVID perspective, when that first report of um, a lockdown situation came on for safety, we all, the majority of us did what we had to do. We, we went into lockdown and then we went into planning mode. Okay, um, who's gonna get the groceries? What, uh, what time does this child need the computer? Okay, do, okay how, how are we gonna ensure that the internet's working? Um, how am I still gonna stay connected? Um, so we did that. Um, the other piece um, specifically around specific death is that grief is a lifelong process and it changes as you go through it. Um, Dr. Alan Wolfelt um, also highlighted um, the three types of support people we, we can come across um, when we are uh, grieving and it's the rule of thirds. So although this was specific for uh, grief and bereavement, this actually um, I'm noticing is present um, as we're going through the pandemic. So one third of people will be empathetic. So they're, they're the empathetic helper. They're uh, joining you where you're at. They're not trying to take the emotion away. Um, they're sitting with you in your distress. Um, they're not trying to take away the experience. They're, they're just there with you. Another third of the people are neutral people. Um, so, th so those are the individuals that help with distractions. So we, um, you know, those are the people that we may call. We don't, we might not necessarily want to talk about COVID or talk about school stress or family stress. We just want to talk about something completely different. And then there's a third of the uh, of people that aren't particularly helpful in grief. So this isn't, they're not intentionally damaging or trying to be harmful, but what, what's happening is they may just try to fix or take the pain away. So if, uh, you know, if it's a student uh, talking to their parent of, I, I don't know what's going to happen in September. Do I get the lease in, in the apartment or do I stay home. So in, so what could be happening is the parent may just try to fix the situation as opposed to allowing the child to experience what's happening. Um, so, and then what happens with, with uh, this particular um, cohort of individuals is that the person who's, who's grieving or is experiencing a, uh, experiencing a loss uh, may, not, may not feel the needed level of support. So what's really important for, for us as so, uh, people who are supporting others, for family members, for students, is we wanna start recognizing where our, our natural supports kind of lie in that, you know, is, are they in an empathetic person, a neutral person, or someone who's not particularly helpful with your grief or loss. Not to say that any of them are, are wrong or, you know, not effective for us, but it's just so we know when we're having, when we're having certain specific needs, who can I reach out to, to have the, have my needs met in that time. So acknowledging without judgment is, is a big thing around just our emotional wellness and, as, and, and particularly around grief and loss without judgment. Um, we, complete, we complete this and our grieving process, um, these steps that are listed, but now we are, we're adapting them um, to address the impact of COVID-19. Um, so uh, these steps were adapted um, from the fam from a family systems theory um, from Joy R. Samuels, and um, her focus was on strategies to guide family uh, adaptation to loss. 
Um, so the shared acknowledgement. So as a family system or as a cohort or you know as a support person within a group, we want we want to acknowledge, you know, if it's if it's a death, we want to acknowledge the death, we want to acknowledge that loss. We also, if it's if it's around COVID and the loss around routine, that disruption disruption and rites of passage, we want to acknowledge that. We want to be saying that outwardly. Then we move into that shared experience. So with shared experience, this is where um, the family system comes in, right? Because everybody in the family system is going to be experiencing this loss from a different lens. That doesn't mean that one person's experience is, is uh, better than another's or more distressing than another's. It's just, it's all coming from a different lens. So we want to be um, acknowledging what the emotional responses are. What what, what's my response to my daughter's response about her having to do online learning? Um, we also want to be acknowledging what has changed now. Uh, we we want to be talking about that um, and how and talking about okay, how is this impacting the family system? Okay, I thought you were going to be out at classes, but now you're home and I'm working from home. Um, and then with regards to, with regards to uh, actual death, the shared experience would be around that emotion um, and the experience of losing, losing someone that's within our system. Then we look at reorganizing and that's when we really want to connect into the problem solving and we want to be specific because when we're feeling stress, when we're feeling distress, um, you know, problems come up and then they, they kind of grow. So we want to be specific around what the problem is and only only address one at a time, one at a time. We're all, um, you know, we're all hyper focused right now on safety. We're all feeling a level of, of being overwhelmed. So we want to break that down. And then we want to investigate those things that we can do or that a family can do as a system um, to regain control control. Um, that's going to help reduce anxiety. Um, that's going to help with increasing our focus to the task at hand. And then the next, the next step is that re reinvestment. So adapting previous coping strategies, um, you know, or our routines, uh, enhancing that connectedness. What we're noticing throughout COVID is we were all really, really active in connecting with other people virtually because it was, you know, a not that it wasn't there, but it was newer, right? And then we've kind of tapered off a bit. So we want to we want to have that reconnect. Uh, we want to have that reconnection. Um, we want to be seeking out or reconnecting with those natural supports or professional supports. Um, and then the other pieces is we want to be striving to maintain a healthy balance. So a healthy balance of activities of pleasure and activities of productivity for ourselves. That's going to help us uh, regain that control. It's also going to help us be able to um, acknowledge our emotions and increase our confidence in our ability to manage them as, as they come up. So how grief is impacting. So this uh, this looks uh, looks at just kind of a natural flow chart. Um, in our hope for grieving is that you know after a loss we would all, we all uh, go into what would be um, normal grief um, or un uncomplicated grief. And then we transition uh, into integrated, integrated grief. However, depending on the situation, um, a person can experience that complicated or prolonged grief. And when we're looking at complicated or prolonged grief, we're looking at grief sy symptoms that are that have been occurring for six months or longer, and that are tr that are um, impacting a person's ability to uh, to uh, complete daily functioning. Um, what we want to remember is that individuals will experience a range of emotions um, during the, the acute grief stage, so that normal grief stage. Um, and then they'll they'll be able to balance the the periods of pain, so we call them pangs of grief, with periods of rest. So the health, uh, the healthy distracting or coping with the, the pre uh, presenting emotions. Um, 
the other the other piece is is a, with the um, more complicated or prolonged grief is that um, the individual would be having difficulty uh, managing or balancing these emotional experiences and at times within prolonged grief is that the individual is seeking out or focusing on things that uh, increase grief um, so doing that uh, emotion activation um, so with uh, normal or uncomplicated grief, these symptoms um, can mimic symptoms of depression in the short term. So we look at physiological symptoms, the tightness of chest, difficulty breathing, uh, muscle tension, as well as they could experience some preoccupation with images of death. Um, we could also be noticing increased emotions that uh, cause differing levels of distress. Um, so that's going to depend on the person them, themselves, but we may um, see that individuals are experiencing feelings of guilt, anger, anxiety, sadness, helplessness, um, shock, and again, that pang of grief. So that intense emotion reaction, that flood of emotion that can come up while we're grieving. Um, Another step or another a component into the, the normal grief is that there's at times short-term shifts in cognition. So disbelief, I can't believe this is happening. This happened at the onset of COVID. I can't believe this is happening, right? We had heard the information. And then when it, when it was in our own um, neighborhood, some, some people had that di disbelief confusion can happen, preoccupation. Um, and then we would notice for grieving, for normal grief or loss, we're going to notice some behavioral changes and we're, we want to look at, you know, is it short term? So again, that six months to a year um, after, after death or after a significant loss. So we look at like sleep disturbances or is the person oversleeping or are they experiencing insomnia? We're gonna be looking at appetite changes. So it has appetite decreased or, or is it increased? Um, social withdrawal is one thing that we really wanna be um, watching for the people that we're, we're providing supports to as well as ourselves. Um, Another, another behavioral change that we want to be aware of is if someone's avoiding reminders of the person who died. Initially that, or, you know, or reminders of the things that we, we're not able to take part in. Um, initially, yeah, that, that can be, that can be expected. Um, you know, and if we look at COVID, like COVID related, at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, the gym was closed. So, so many people were buying um, weights and different, um, different exercise equipment for the home, I'm going to, I'm going to exercise at home. But you know, over time, what it could turn into, my gym's closed, so I'm not going to go exercise. With regards to students, what it could be is, you know, I can't be on campus, so I'm not going to engage in, in the social opportunities that are offered online, or I can't be on, on campus for my lecture, so, you know what, I'm not really going to listen or focus in on my lecture, or, you know, I'm not following the, the, the schedule for, for my classes that I should be. Um, Again, with that complicated grief, that's when we would be assessing for that and watching for that six months to a year after loss or death. Um, and um, with regards to COVID right now, we're really, because we're hitting that year mark, this is where we're looking at it from a mental health perspective and shifting, um, shifting supports and um, the amount of supports or the intensity of supports that people are being provided. Um, what we would look for, so those warning signs for that prolonged grief is that persistent, um, intense feeling of grief. So it hasn't dissipated at all. Um, it's still quite high. Um, that grief continues or the loss continues to dominate the person's person's life. So, um, you know, they're, they're seeing their future as bleak or empty. Um, and that we have that long standing decrease in daily functioning. Um, the next one is um, 
is that there's a difficulty with the acceptance of the loss. So acceptance of the situation that we're at with regards to COVID, with regards to formal grief, that the person is just not accepting that, that their loved one or, or, or this person has died. Um, and then we also look at, is the person experiencing continued avoidance or reminders of the person that has died? So um, they're, they're trying to just focus on escaping from from the emotion. Um, so then we get into that integrated grief. And that's when we were noticing that the intense symptoms um, are, are it's the, we, we don't have the intensity of the symptoms and grief has been resolved. Um, the acceptance of the loss or the death has, has occurred and daily functioning is starting to come back. Um, individuals are taking part in activities. Um, you know, they're, they're, um, they're being present in the moment with, with other people. Um, the one thing with with grief is that it's a lifelong process. So we we're we're always we may always experience pangs of grief, but what happens is as we allow ourselves to move through it, as we allow ourselves to experience the emotions that come along with it, is we're building our confidence and our ability to manage uh, manage the emotion when it presents. Um, when we have that increased confidence, um, we're able to, we're able to move through, and we're able to tap into those effective uh, coping strategies that uh, that we've set up uh, set up for ourselves. So, coping with grief and loss. There's um, some points on the screen here. Um, the the one thing is that we have to remember that grief is not about being strong for others. Um, we have to give ourselves time to recognize that it's a journey. So, you know, I know um, a great deal of you are supporting students, right? And, and um, we have to understand that, you know, we're experiencing a loss too. When we can't be face to face with individuals, if that's what we're typically accustomed to that's a loss for us so we go, we want to we want to recognize our own emotions in this and then the other the biggest one uh, for this is you have to trust yourself you are you are where you're supposed to be right now emotionally um, we know um, and we want to remind people that uh, emotions ebb and flow. They go up and down. And sometimes, you know, we may just feel like we're going backwards. Um, and, and that's okay. That's okay to, to have that, to experience that. We just want to remind ourselves that this, this process is temporary. And, you know, as we're, as we're going through it, um, that that trust is imperative, that trust in ourselves. I know that was a lot of information there, Chris. I don't know if you have any questions for that. Um, I'm not sure about uh, the other audience members listening, but I was thinking and comparing it to over the course of 2020 when I was doing some faculty work and um, going through this process with students and, and there was a big push to like adjust, adapt, try to take measures to make sure you're there. And, and as you're talking, I, I think a lot more about that, that acceptance piece, like, uh, respecting and honoring the process and and maybe just um, instead of trying to do so many different things or novel things or something different creating an open space for the students and and letting them just go through it and maybe just trying to keep our curriculum plans as they kind of were and just just being able to go with the flow in that regard was one of the big takeaways you you gave me and the second thing I was just thinking about my own experience and oftentimes had this pattern where I would intellectualize probably my own sense, like I, my own feelings. Like I know something was a bit dis, uh, discomforting or uncomfortable and I would start doing those at least statements to myself. Like at least I'm not as bad off as, as this person or things could be worse. And I was kind of realizing like, I just wasn't respecting or honoring my own emotional expression that probably need to happen. Um, so I'm just wondering if there's a, any, any advice you'd have to sort of create that space in a healthy way for someone who might struggle to not go to that at least intellectualization of a discomfort um, in that case? 
Well, and it's the one the one way um, to to help with that is again first acknowledging that thought, so that at least thought. So as soon as we have that acknowledgement, then we know okay, this is where we want to we want to start moving through. We want to then start um, looking at um, what is the emotion that I'm experiencing. What is it? Let's label it. Let's put a name on it, so it's not just this flood that comes over. Let's really let's really label it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then we want to be looking at, okay, what brought this flood of emotion on right now? Um, and then what happens is by doing that and breaking it down for ourselves, we're quieting that, um, you know, those, uh, those statements that, well, it's not, I don't have it as bad as, as this person or at least, right? So it's giving ourselves credit for, for, the, for allowing ourselves to experience the emotion. The more we can do that, um, the more we're gonna, we're, the more we're going to increase our overall sense of control internally. That's gonna help with anxiety, that's gonna help with low mood, um, and that's going to, that's, what's going to help with our ability to shift focus more fluid, be, being fluid with the shifting focus. So it's just really breaking it down, identifying the actual emotion that you're experiencing and then asking that why, well, okay, how did, how did that happen? Um, and I'll, 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 I'll move into it a little bit more for, through, through this, this, uh, portion of it, but, um, when we're when we're labeling that emotion for ourselves, we're taking away that that fear that happens with it, right? That oh, okay, I'm I'm just gonna feel this way, and that almost that shutting that down that can occur. Um, so it helps um, in combination to slow down that those comparison thoughts, or the um, are not giving our emotions enough credit, right? Our emotions are our body's first warning sign. They shoot off for us, right? Um, um, so any emotion that's being experienced is the right emotion in the moment. It's what we do with the emotion afterwards. So we want to, especially with students, we want to be normalizing that. It doesn't matter what emotion you're experiencing. If, if your body's shooting off that emotion, that's, that's where it's at right now, right? But it's what we do with it moving forward. So again, like you were saying, um, that normalization, having that open conversation, having that narrative, just so it can be free flowing. So it's not built up, right? So we're not getting to that significant intense level of distress. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and we have about five more minutes before opening the floor up to some other questions. So I just wanted to let you know that as you okay. shift into this third phase. Okay. So what I'll do, um, uh, the, I know you were saying that the um, slides will be uh, posted as well. So I might not go into the specific research, um, but I want to just kind of really move into this acceptance work. So with regards to the, uh, with regards to overall acceptance, like we were saying, that's that practice that we give ourselves to accept a situation without judgment and releasing a thought when we're, when we're ready or when we've had enough, enough of that. Um, so dialectical behavior therapy is, is really rich in this. Um, and the one concept with this is, is turning the mind. Um, so what we want to be doing is when a situation occurs is we want to observe, okay, are we accepting the situation for what it is? And acceptance just doesn't mean sunshine and rosy and happy or, and it doesn't, it doesn't mean either that we're being complacent. It's just accepting it for the situation for what it is. Um, are we making those statements like, why me? It shouldn't be this way. Um, when we're saying those kind of statements, we're not really accepting the situation for what it is. What we want to do is we want to make that commitment to ourselves that you know this is the, this is the reality for right now, and I'm I'm I, and we want to stop fighting fighting it or, or trying or trying to fight the fact that we don't have control over it. Um, because when we're not accepting a situation, it actually causes us to suffer. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to um, shift something that we we don't have control over. So we look into again, like we were talking about previously, like those problem solving skills, right? 
is what's the specific problem in the in the in the moment is this in my control yes or no if it is in my control then i want to start breaking down into steps what are the steps i can take to address it if it's not then what we want to be doing is looking um into you know distracting or coping strategies that we can complete to support us in that the other piece that we really want to be doing is we want to validate our emotions. We want to validate our own emotions and the emotions of others. Again, like I was saying, emo the emotions that you're experiencing aren't wrong. Um, we, we want to be aware of them so we are able to address them using our coping strategies. Um, some of the research that came out from re uh, the Mental Health Research Canada noted um, back in October that our previous coping strategies and the routines that we had in place aren't necessarily as effective for us anymore as we're moving to this stage in, in the pandemic. So what we want to be doing consistently is really reviewing the effectiveness of our coping strategies. <clears throat> We um, we want to acknowledge the things that we've had to change, acknowledge the things that we're missing. And then if, you know, if a coping strategy, you know, spending time with family, if, if that face to face, if that was really impactful, you know, last March, but, you know, there's more frustration right now. Um, we want to review how can we shift the interactions? And that's another thing that's been coming up through some statistical research is just that interaction within the household um you know over can throughout canada people aren't recognizing that as a as a you know a, a, a positive support right now because what's happening is that individuals aren't addressing the base of the stress so the one thing we want to be doing with that acceptance is again really drilling it down Am I going to accept the situation right now? And then we want to focus on is what is the base? What is the root of the stress? Because if we're not allowing ourselves to get there, we're kind of doing a Band-Aid effect, right? And that's going to impact our overall uh, emotion experience, how we're interacting with others and how we're processing the uh, loss and, and, and grief around uh, what's occurring with COVID. So Chris, what I can do is I can close off my, my uh, sharing if you want, because I had just had some, um, some stats, but I'll, just, I'll make sure that those get, get sent off. And then- Sure, that'd be great. Questions. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay. Um, and I, I do see some questions popping okay. up now for you. So I, I think we could dive in and, and sort of address some of those. Okay. Um, I'll just go in order that I saw them come in. So I, I see the first one uh, from Steven Sutherland. Hey, Steven, how are you doing? Um, he says, COVID-19 certainly has created tremendous impact in the area of grief and loss. Assessment and continued step care is a great intervention. So the question, or the initial question for you, there's two parts. What role does group support, or what role do support groups or peer support play in the recovery process? And is there any research that you can share about timing of grief and loss support groups? Uh, final comment he makes is the la lack of these groups is troubling in the province of Manitoba. Okay, um, so with regards to, and, and I'm going to speak from my experience at CMHA here in Windsor. So with regards to uh, grief and loss, we have bereavement counseling, individual counseling for prolonged grief. What we've, what we've done and what we've recommended is that people engage in group, um, specifically around um, just a grief, grief and bereavement education seminar. So really the first step within the, that first six months would be to give people that psychoeducation around this is what's anticipated this yes what you're experiencing this is what we would um we would anticipate that you're experiencing for more traumatic deaths um you know we always want to be evaluating a, a, where a person's at if it's a, a death of a child um traumatic death through a homicide or suicide, um, that would be the time where we would, we would connect into um, uh, 
formal therapy, that one-to-one -one therapy initially, but it's also knowing that what might be a traumatic death for us, someone else may not have that same kind of grief uh, experience. So um, with regards to group, we always recommend group. What we do on our end, um, you know, for our, our spousal loss support group, we have a group facilitator that would call and connect with clients just to ensure that, you know, the individual would be able to handle another person's grief story, right? We don't want to, we don't want to be putting someone in a situation where their grief would be exasperated. Um, so doing that formal, that, that formal just phone call, you know, that, that, that screener for back, lack of a better word. Um, we want to be doing that check-in, but gr group work is imperative in grief and loss um, because it helps normalize. And sometimes hearing another person's experience um, is, um, is it, you know, it validates. Um, so I know uh, this, this question was from Manitoba and I don't know if we have that email, um, but what I'll do is I'll leave the email uh, because on our, our on our YouTube site, we have the grief and bereavement seminar that anybody any anywhere over the world could click on, and it's our it's our facilitator, um, as well as we have some other really nice resources that aren't necessarily directed to CMHA, but I could send that off. So if, if, if this great. individual could just send me an email uh, and and just remind me of this is the topic, then I can do that. I could also add that uh, link to that seminar potentially oh. in the archived webinar when I put it up on our site. Oh, perfect. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The, the next question is from um, an anonymous attendee. Um, do you have any suggestions for easy and accessible resources that students or other staff members with no background in grief could review to come a little bit closer to understanding the process and how it is connected? So it sounds like what you just mentioned might be related to that. Um, many people I work with really appreciate the article back in the spring, which was one from the Harvard Business Review, it looks like, and it said it was titled The Discomfort You're Feeling is Grief. So any other recommendations or resources? Um, again, what I'll do is I'll provide uh, Chris with the links um, because I can't I can't uh, recall the the specific website, and uh, I'll make sure Chris has those links that um, he'll be able to post. Um, I want to say it's griefandloss.ca, but but I, again, I don't want to give the misinformation. I want to make sure that I'm giving sure. um, research base, but I'll, I'll make sure that there's a, a list of, of resources. Sounds great. And to everyone listening, um, you will get a follow-up email uh, that notifies you once the webinar is up and archived. And so the link to all of those resources that we do curate on there will be available to you. Um, the next question is from Carly Schnur. And she says, due to being online slash social media more because of COVID, I find that comparison issues are becoming worse for some. Do you have any advice on how to talk to someone um, who is doing much of this comparing to others? Um, so, so the first thing is um, with with social media. I always, you know, if people can, as a starting point, refrain from reading comments. Um, that one tends to drive things uh, drive things a bit more. Depending on on the comfort level, because we know we're all, and myself included, I'm prone to jumping on my phone and and starting to kind of scroll through things. What we want to do is we want to set time limits on um, our social media access. If we're noticing that we're having a lot of that unfair comparison, doing credit lists at the end of the day um, is is really uplifting for people. So it doesn't it doesn't and we don't have to get into a big narrative, but it can even just be point form. So things that I did really well today and point form it, and it doesn't have to be something huge. If it was I woke up and I just didn't feel like going getting out of bed, but I got up, I got out of bed. That's a credit. Um, what to help reduce those unfair comparisons is starting to take in those positive inputs. Um, and then the one thing, especially with my younger clients, what I do is I always remind people that nine times out of ten on any social media platform, people are showing their A sites, 
or not seeing like, you know what, I woke <laughs> up and I had a massive headache and my hair is awful today. We, we People aren't posting that. So I, especially with my younger clients, um, teenage and university, um, I remind them that all the time that we're not showing the A sides. Um, and I, and you know, and, and also, you know, have them recognize, okay, what is one person that you know you were on the phone with and they were having a really rough day but their social media post said like, everything's great. And you know, I just want a million dollars. We want to start challenging it with facts. So based on what's happening within their own social circles, and then we can broaden it. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I have one more question from, and we have a couple minutes left. So maybe we can just try to get to this last one from uh, Danielle Frenette. She asks, do you have any advice on how to assist our international students? Being so far away from friends and family, we are their adopted family here in Canada. How can we better support these students? Um, with that, again, would be looking depending on where you're where you're at. What what are the type of platforms that you're able to use? Um, can you set up um, you know just social connections and sometimes people they might they may be even be a little bit apprehensive so is it that there's a like you know for fun activity is there some sort of online game that everybody can just kind of take part in from the comfort of and the safety of their own homes um or you know is it the screen sharing of a movie or or something the other piece that could help is um, if you can connect students that are having the similar, the same similar experience, because that's going to help normalize it again too. That's the biggest piece with uh, with loss is that normalization. As the person of support, and this is probably the hardest thing um, for all of us to do, myself included, is to set those boundaries, right? We wanna make sure that we are not risking uh, burnout ourselves, uh, that caregiver burnout. Um, so, so giving people resources, setting up activities, connecting students with one another, um, you know, students that would have that shared experience, especially with international students, I completely understand, right? They're so far away from home. And yeah, of course, you're going to take on that caregiver role. So how, so what we want to look at is, you know, firstly, is how can we increase their, their coping strategies? Let's kind of investigate what are some of the things they really enjoy doing? How can we um, get creative um, so they can still be taking on those activities? Great. Well, thank you so much, Dana, uh, both for the, the presentation, all of the information and, and taking some time to answer these questions. Um, with the last minute here, I just wanted to remind everyone that this will be archived. The recording will be up on our website, along with the slides from the presentation and the link to some of the resources that Dana just mentioned she would share with us. So once again, thank you to everyone for taking the time to join us this month. We hope you can join us again next month for the upcoming webinar. Uh, feel free to check out our website for more information about that. And uh, I hope everyone has a great day. And I've and I've just added my email to the chat there. Um, so if there's any other questions awesome. that we didn't get to, um, it, it's dstjean at cmha-wecb.on.ca. Well, thank you so much for providing that that uh, that option to everyone. And I encourage everyone who is interested to please reach out to Dana or reach out to the CICMH. Uh, thanks again. Okay.